Our next speaker is Dr. Rick Glazier. And uh, Rick is a senior scientist and program lead for the primary care and population health at ISIS. He's also a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, a senior scientist at the Center for Research on Inner City Health, and the Keenan Research Center of the Lee Kaixing Knowledge Institute at St. Michael's Hospital, a family physician in his spare time from the looks of it, <laughs> in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at St. Michael's Hospital. So Rick is going to talk to us about risks, burdens, and places, a real ISIS approach to populations. So Rick. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak about this topic. They said it needed to be about uh, immigration, it needed to be about Aboriginal health, it needed to be about mental health, and I think they added about 22 other things to it. So I, I have to tell you that my approach was um, kind of helplessness. I didn't exactly know what to do. So we sent a message out to every member of our program, present and past, that we could possibly think of, and asked, I asked them to send me slides. So those who have been left out are those who did not send me slides. <laughs> And those who did send me slides, you'll, feel your, you'll, you'll see your work really, really nicely represented, I hope. Uh, but somewhat like, Craig, uh, like Craig's disclaimer, I may not be able to tell you a lot about these studies, so we'll call on those people, most of whom are here, to talk about them if you have questions. So uh, again, we've got the kind of history, and I'll take a historical approach, although not year by year, uh, but I will take you maybe uh, half decade by half decade to say that we've already heard today that starting in the early 1990s, the work of novel data and innovative approaches was all about those 10-inch tapes and identifying the same person twice, uh, you know, in two different hospitalizations, for example, and this was really pioneering, and this idea that there was area variation in things like cesarean sections and preventive health care was, uh, was new. It was, it, was, it was all brand new, and the a lot of the focus was on hospitals, but around the same time, we've also heard of the Ontario Health, uh, uh, the OHS, the Ontario Health Study, and uh, this was really fertile ground for ISIS because for the first time, there was a representative population sample with health risks and health behaviors, and uh, several people, Vivek in particular, uh, were able to jump into that area and publish absolutely like crazy. By the late 1990s, we were enriching the data, and I'll show you an example of Don's work. Is Don, Don still here? Yeah. Um, uh, so we started to bring in and link data from places like cell phone towers. So this is like a major lateral move, and of course it was Don that did that work. Um, but, uh, but validation, data quality, analytical work, uh, in addition to just the descriptive work, really uh, started to take off in the late 1990s. By the early 2000s, there were linked data. We started to have waves of the Canadian Community Health Survey, the NPHS and the CCHS started to be linked where we could take people with all that rich data and follow them forward for years. And people have made wonderful use of those linked data and lots of advanced modeling studies have been done. We started to look at much more sophisticated approaches to uh, the data. Uh, more recently, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure why I put lab data in, we still don't have OLIS, but people are starting to bring in lab extracts. Uh, we've got the death registration, we've got lots and lots of risk data. Uh, burden of illness studies were all in vogue about a year or two ago. We had actually a three, four year program of uh, research with Public Health Ontario that's been incredibly rich looking at uh, burden studies, and I'll talk about those. And then we've had some really sophisticated modeling, uh, particularly by Doug Manuel and, uh, and colleagues uh, that uh, uh, tells us how to get more years of life, so I'll go into that briefly as well. So it, it's very hard to name any names, but at, at a meeting at Public Health Ontario not too long ago, when we were talking about an emerging theme and an and eventual program in, in uh, public health population health at ISIS, uh, we noted that VVAC had kind of come into uh, David Naylor's orbit and that uh, shortly after that, Don Redelmeyer came along, but that Doug was actually Vivek's student, and Jeff uh, and, and Laura Rosella and others were, were Doug's students. And so we've got this sort of generational thing on the population public health side of ISIS, where the trainees are now um, uh, playing huge roles and, and, uh, and, and, and taking on major, major studies uh, with, with large impact, and it's very gratifying to see that. You can see, though, from that handful of people, we now have an enormous number of people engaged in, um, uh, engaged over, over four sites, soon to be more, um, in the business of population and public health. 
and that we could not do it without an, a, a, our wonderful, wonderful analyst coordinators, uh, uh, program uh, administrator and, uh, and, and leads that have been absolutely unbelievable. But uh, these are the folks that make the research actually happen and the program run. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you some examples uh, on the risks to start with. And you can see some of them, uh, some of them there depicted. And so some examples would be that it's a really, really bad thing to be talking on your cell phone 20 minutes before a car crash. That's right, Don, isn't it? <laughs> but it's a much worse thing to be talking on the cell phone one to five minutes before your car crash. That's a correct interpretation? Yeah, I thought so. So this is Land Landmark New England Journal study, and I was very gratified to, for me, I was in the car, um, on the day that the uh, legislation came in, um, uh, uh, making talking on the cell phone illegal, and the call-in noon hour radio show was uh, none other than, than, uh, than Don talking about the importance and certainly wanting to go to hands-free as well, but because uh, it's a big distraction too. But nonetheless, there's lots and lots of huge policy impact from ISIS work. Um, this is work by, uh, by a graduate student, um, Aisha Lofters, uh, looking at a, a, a really innovative, uh, fairly new data set from Citizenship and Immigration Canada, where the world region of origin is, uh, is actually uh, available, uh, country of origin, date of landing, immigrant status. And you can see on your far left, that's actually South Asia and Middle East, North Africa, where uh, pap smear rates are very, very low. And you can see the variation actually exceeds socioeconomic status or comes close to socioeconomic status, which is on the bottom. And when you put all these things together, you find that the variation is, is absolutely unbelievable and, and really kind of unconscionable to consider that in Ontario, uh, younger Canadian-born women living in high-income neighbourhoods and belonging to one of these primary care patient enrollment models, to which now three-quarters of the population belong, have close to 80% rates of, uh, of, uh, uh, of cervical cancer screening. Uh, on the other hand, uh, older South Asian women living in the lowest income neighborhoods and not in a patient enrollment model are uh, pushing at around 20%. So we've got close to a full fourfold four -fold variation. And, and um, women, that latter group, are at much higher risk of, of cervical cancer. Many have been never screened and many come from areas of the world with much higher rates. Um, similarly, a, another graduate student uh, looked at diabetes. Uh, this is the work of Marisa Creatori. Uh, looked at diabetes risk um, and found that uh, certain populations had enormous risks. This is uh, prevalence, but she's also done really interesting studies on incidents looking at our need to screen probably something like 15 years earlier in some populations uh, like South Asian than in other populations. But here you can see uh, relative risks, odds ratios of between three and four uh, compared with Western Europe for diabetes. Um, uh, this is the work of, uh, again, the last slide on, on immigration. This is the work of Mar Marcelo Urquia, uh, now an ISIS scientist, former graduate student, uh, who looked at, who found that, that recent immigrants actually seem to have lower risks when they first come to Canada. This is preterm birth, and you can see on your far left at duration of residence that the newest uh, arrivals actually have quite low rates, lower than the Canadian general population. Fifteen years later, they have surpassed the uh, Canadian average, and you can see that the duration is actually a more important, um, a more important determinant than whether the neighborhood they live in has low, medium, or high areas of deprivation. And something relatively toxic about the Canadian environment, possibly lying on the couch with the remote control, possibly uh, a fast food, possibly living in an unwalkable area. We're not sure what all of those risks are, but there seems to be something that's pretty bad for you the longer you live here compared with having come. I'm going to refer to uh, the Aboriginal health that has been Aboriginal health research that's been going on at ISIS, and I'm going to attribute these enormous advances uh, to to their several people. Uh, Beju Shaw was involved in a lot of this early work, but I think one of the reasons this has moved forward so well is that David Henry personally committed to moving this forward. It may have been his experience in Australia with Aboriginal health, I'm not sure, but uh, the time and effort that has gone into establishing these relationships with the Chiefs of Ontario and with the Métis Nation of Ontario and with other groups has been absolutely astounding. And the major findings have been not a surprise, I, I don't think, but documenting these disparities and documenting the healthcare needs and documenting the gaps between high disease burden and low access to care 
is incredibly important for moving policy and appropriate care forward. So even just in the case of diabetes, high prevalence, high incidence, low specialist care, and high AMI complications are some of the things that were found in the linked Made Nation of Ontario registry when it was linked to ISIS data. And there are other findings there as well. Um, this is work uh, looking at uh, injury-related emergency department visits and hospitalizations in children so that when we, uh, so the epidemiology of injury, the basic epidemiology of injury is incredibly important. I believe this is Nancy Young's work, but just looking at the, uh, these relationships uh, by age uh, with, uh, uh, by, by emergency department, age and sex, by emergency department visits and hospitalizations gives us some clues into prevention because most of these are not accidents, most of these are predictable and avoidable. Uh, this is work, I believe, of uh, Astrid Gutman and, uh, and, and, and several other uh, of her colleagues looking at the idea that the more you receive preventive health care, higher degrees of preventive health care in children is associated with lower emergency department visits. And so there's something about the quality of care, possibly also about care seeking, that seems to be, uh, have relationships uh, uh, here. We've had three major studies that I alluded to earlier around burden of infectious diseases, mental health, and unhealthy living, and I'll just touch on some of those. This is work that Jeff Kwong and his colleagues did in conjunction with Public Health Ontario, very important study um, uh, called OMBOIDS, looking at the top 20 infectious agents. They also looked at the top syndromes and found that things like hepatitis C, uh, again, because they're so chronic, uh, uh, have very, very high um, uh, impact and very high burden of illness. This is the uh, pioneering work of Doug Manuel and his, uh, and his colleagues. The online calculator for this has been hit thousands and thousands, maybe tens. Doug, Doug is here somewhere. He'll know how many times uh, this has been hit, but there's an online calculator where you can go find out, like I did, that you don't drink enough alcohol. <laughs> Uh, child and Youth Mental Health Service Records, uh, uh, this is the bold new frontier at ISIS. Um, I would say this is the work of, of Anne Rhodes, I believe, that um, uh, child protection data, social service data, education data um, are now being, uh, now being linked and uh, as David Henry has said a few times today and others, uh, the idea that we're expanding beyond health into determinants of health and into other societal issues is just incredibly e exciting. I'm going to talk briefly about places, um, just the idea that uh, we collect data in a variety of places. So we are now collecting data on close to 300,000 patients in many different areas of Ontario from uh, their actual clinical record and linking them at ISIS. Uh, this is the work, uh, the earlier work on walkability and diabetes. The red areas have high uh, uh, diabetes and low walkability. Uh, the blue areas have low diabetes and very good walkability in Toronto. We also have places, and I want to attribute a lot of this work, the maps I'm showing you were all drawn by Peter Gazdira. Peter, I think, is here, our ISIS geographer with whom I've had the pleasure for working, working with for about uh, more than a decade now. But you can see there are actually very few places in southern Ontario. There are, uh, contrarily, lots of places in northern Ontario where you're more than half an hour drive from a family doctor. That doesn't mean they can see you, of course but the geographic access is good. Uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of wonderful work. There are lots of health disparities in the primary care atlas and the pioneering work of uh, Ross Upshur and Lisa, Lisa Jacobina need to be acknowledged. Uh, the work that ISIS has been doing on injuries and raising this issue at the population level. Uh, the issue of walkability and diabetes, as has been mentioned, and the power study, if we're talking about population health and health disparities, an enormous uh, multi-volume work that many, many people in this room and many people at ISIS were engaged in. So I'm going to finish by just kind of uh, connecting the past with the future uh, in saying that this was uh, pi the pioneering work um, from the folks you've already heard a lot about today, uh, Vivek, Kerry, and uh, Jack. Uh, enthusiasm or uncertainty, small area variations in use of mammography services in Ontario. So this is the pioneering uh, descriptive work about, uh, about area variation. And we'd like to link that, or I'd like to link that with the life expectancy calculator. You can all just, you know, hit the URL and, uh, and, and find out all about it. But we've gone from uh, uh, what was at the time pioneering, difficult, complicated, brand new data to what is now complicated, difficult, sophisticated, pioneering data analyses. And I think in the area of population health, we have reason to be tremendously proud and hopeful about the future.